Hi right, everybody, welcome to the Frankie Slauson Show, and uh, I'm your host Frankie Slauson, and with me I got a guy who is known for doing a lot of voice work, whether it be in professional wrestling, whether it be in commercials, or whether it be uh, a current uh, icon on uh, Frosted Flakes, I have for you Mr. Lee Marshall. How's it going, Lee? Absolutely beautiful. It's uh, into the 70s at the beach today. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you you obviously have nice weather. I'm I'm in northern Minnesota, and uh, we're like below zero temperatures. Not a good thing. <laughs> I was like I was like Minnesota, but not in the winter. Yeah, uh, uh, back in the early days or whatever, uh, you uh, you got to do some stuff for like AWA, and, and uh, did you like Minnesota overall as a state? Well. You know, I traveled around, like you know, certainly with AWA and and uh, you know WWF and and WCW, and uh, yeah, I, I always enjoyed it. I always had great fun there. And I know, uh, see, I'm real close to where uh, the Fargo Dome was, and I remember uh, a few times when you guys had uh, Nitro, and I think even a Thunder taping or whatever at the Fargo Dome. I'm like maybe three hours away from there. Absolutely love the Fargo Dome. It, 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 it's a little bit, uh, it's a smaller version of uh, uh, but the uh, facility in San Antonio. Really nice. Oh yeah, it's a nice big, uh, big dome. Anyway, it's uh, we, yeah. we have we have we have uh, many different uh, arenas like that around my area where I live, and it's, so it's kind of cool to see any type of attraction, whether it be wrestling or a concert or anything like that. So, uh, so let's talk about let's talk about you, Lee, and uh, let's talk about like your early days. Uh, like before you became an announcer, or like before you, uh, like when you first started doing radio, how was that experience well, for you? I started in radio, and uh, radio is still my true, true passion. Always, always was, and always has been. Uh, I started in radio when I was, uh, got my first full time job, and I was a high school sophomore. And uh, my first introduction to radio and TV actually came when I was a first grader uh, in Hollywood. And there was a show called Art Linkletter's House Party, and he had a feature called "Kids Say the Darndest Things," <laughs> and I was and I was one of those kids. I was in first grade, but uh, yeah, when I was fourteen, I started my radio career. I always always aspired to. I was always fascinated by it, and uh, you know, uh, been uh, been real fortunate in my radio career. And, and, started out in okay, go ahead. in Phoenix, uh, uh, stayed in Phoenix for a while, and worked at very legendary radio station there called Kriz, K-R-I-Z, and then, uh, you know, went to uh, Los, you know, came home to Los Angeles and have been in uh, San Diego and Detroit and uh, New York City and uh, but primarily Los Angeles. And that's kind of the area where you kind of call home pretty much, huh? Oh, absolutely. I was born and raised here. Yeah, you're, you're lucky. I mean, over here in Minnesota, like I was saying, it's, it's a different territory. Uh, you, you get hardly no snow over there, but I suppose you have to worry about earthquakes once in a while. Oh, every so often. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, uh, it was just the uh, 19th anniversary of the Northridge earthquake here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so how, when, when you get in an earthquake, like how do you, uh, how do you prepare for it uh, when it happens? You know, I mean, you just, you know, you have stuff standing by. You have water and some emergency stuff, you know, in the garage or whatever. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's something that we deal with from time to time. And, and uh, you know, we get little minor earthquakes all the time. It's no big deal. And uh, when you uh, did radio, did you uh, did you have any heroes, like Wolfman Jack or anything, that kind of inspired you to uh, become a DJ? Interesting you'd say Wolfman Jack. He was one of them. Uh, another man that... Uh, you know, I still see from time to time who your listeners or viewers might know is Gary Owens. Uh, but, yeah, Wolfman, uh, I actually had the opportunity to work with Wolfman, which was, was a huge thrill because he was one of my heroes. It uh, loved him to death with an outrageously creative radio personality and uh, learned a lot from him. And what was, like, the, the format uh, or the radio format that you worked for when you first started your radio? I was, I was always, uh, well, for the most part, I was a rock and roller. Okay. You know, uh, and, and, and I started radio at the absolute best time musically that you could start in radio, which was right at the beginning of the British Invasion. You know, oh. the Beatles and the Stones and Hermits Hermits and the Dave Clark Five and the Who. And it was a great time because there was just this incredible influx of, 
a great music. And, uh, you know, here in the U.S., we had, you know, the Beach Boys were happening and Motown was just starting. So it couldn't have been a better time. And, and I think the movie American Graffiti was really, because even I was a former uh, radio announcer as well at one time, and, and that movie kind of inspired me, and I'm sure it kind of inspired you too, uh, to, to kind of know what it's like to, to be a fun DJ, more or less. Well, when, when American Graffiti came out, I'd already been on the air for eight or nine years. <laughs> well, I was already having a lot of fun. So. <laughs> Have you ever listened to any boring radio stations before? Boring? Yeah, most of them. <laughs> we got some around here, too, that are kind of, they, they, they call themselves uh, very uh, wild and entertaining, but, uh, yeah, I, I've heard better. <laughs> no, no, there, there, there's, uh, you know, every so often you hear a good radio station, most often you don't. And, and that really pains me, because radio really used to be, you know, the exclusive home for the, the, the funniest, the most creative, the most spontaneous the most well-read, the most informed, the, the hippest people, you know, in, in, in any market. Well, now it's not. Now, now so much of it is, is syndicated. You know, it's one size fits all. You know, there's some guy broadcasting from, uh, you know, from Atlanta that couldn't find Minneapolis with a, with a map and a dog. <laughs> so, so he has absolutely no affinity for the people that, to whom they're speaking. And, you know, my watchword, you know, the way I was trained, because you've got to know your audience. You've got to know your audience. And it, it changes from, from market to market. Even markets within a single state, the audience is much different. You know, the audience is, is so different in San Francisco than it is in Los Angeles, for example. Uh -huh. So, uh, like, how would you, like, how would you rate yourself as far as, like, a DJ? Like, with 10 being the best and 0 being the worst, how would you rate yourself as a, as a DJ for the audience? Yeah, jeepers. And then I, uh, you know, did it for uh, about 45 years. I'd have to say I'd, I'd, I'd at least have to be a nine. Yeah, I would say. You, know, you don't, don't get, get to do it that long if you're not any good. <laughs> 45 years but already. Wow, yeah. that's a long time. Guys who are much better than me. <laughs> what do you think of, uh, like, Ryan Seacrest? Do you think he's a pretty good DJ? No. <laughs> not really. I can't I believe it. Right. I can't believe that they're uh, they're letting him take over the the Dick Clark's Rock and New Year's Eve. You know, even though Dick Clark's well, not alive anymore, but still, you know, it's. I'm not suggesting that Ryan's not a talent because he is, but I just wonder how much of it is, is his own creativity, or how much of his own creativity he's allowed to present. You yeah. know, radio now you've got to you know read what's ever on a card, and yeah, you know. You know, no disc jockeys now get to play the music they want to play. It's all pre-programmed into a hard drive of a computer. You know, when I started, you actually played 45s. You actually had records on a turntable. And the disc jockeys could play, I don't want to say whatever they wanted, because it was all formatted. You know, you had to play, if, if, if you started the hour with, with a top ten song, you know, at least you had ten songs from which to pick. Well, not, not anymore, not now. Yeah, it's definitely different, and and I would love to to try it back if I was alive. Even well, I was alive back in the '80s and stuff. But if I was like an adult, like I am now, I would love to see what it was like uh, when you actually had to work your butt off in order to be uh, a, a DJ and actually flip records and cl uh, cassettes and everything like that, compared to now being all on the computer. Well, there's a difference now, and and the difference is guys on the radio now do a shit. Guys back in the day did a show, and there's a world of difference between doing a shift and doing a show. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, and, and uh, with with you uh, doing the radio and stuff, it got you into doing like commercials and stuff. Uh, I was uh, very impressed to know that you've done some some voiceover work for just uh, random commercials. Like, what are some of the most notable besides the big one that you work for? What are some of the most uh, nor notable uh, commercials that you've done? Oh, geez. Uh, <laughs> a, a lot of them. You know, Chevron, Chevrolet, Saab, uh, American Express. Um, you know, hundreds. Literally hundreds. Yeah, because uh, uh, it said uh, on your on the Wikipedia page, anyway, that you're, you, you are the premier person for the voice over commercial guy. Well, you know, I'm certainly one of them. You know, but, but I gotta tell you, I don't, I don't have a real big range. 
you know, a lot of guys have a huge range, and I don't. But there are a lot of people that have a voice quality that's similar to mine. So, so uh, yeah, I can fill a, a reasonable size piece of the uh, of the voice acting community. Sure, and and and, uh, and uh, was it because of the voice that you were able to uh, perfect your Tony the Tiger character? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, the uh, the man that originally did Tony the Tiger, a man named Thurl Ravenscroft, you know, he and I obviously sound very much alike. And uh, oddly, he and I worked together on a number of projects before we passed away. So, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, we you know, blessed enough to uh, to have that voice. And it's, it's a wonderful opportunity, and, and I, I embrace the, you know, to, to be what's been described as the most iconic and successful character in the history of advertising. Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, I, I really, uh, I'm really uh, honored just to have you on the show and everything. To, uh, because you, I mean, Tony the Tiger. I mean, that's that's a iconic figure, you know. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. He's he's pretty iconic. And I, I've done TV shows and movies and you know and video games and cartoon shows. And, you know, I, I do a lot of stuff other than Tony. Yeah. What type of video games have you done? Oh, jeepers! You know. Most of them violent. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I'm kind of typecast in some areas of being a, a you know a, a villainous guy because of my voice. Uh-huh. So uh, if ever they need you know a real scoundrel, I'm usually uh, usually called in. Have you ever worked for like the Grand Theft Auto video games at all? I've, I've never done a Grand Theft Auto, and uh, quite honestly, don't know that I'd want to be associated with anything quite like that. <laughs> I don't know. I I kind of enjoy them. They're they're kind of fun games. They might they might be a little violent, but I I enjoy the radio portion of it. You know, just because you can play music yeah. and stuff. <laughs> oh sure, sure, sure. <laughs> but it, you know, radio allowed me to get into wrestling. Yeah. Uh, when I started in wrestling, it was all territories. You know, I'm wondering how many of your listeners even know what that is anymore. Probably not many. <laughs> well, okay, well, well, very briefly. There was no one company that controlled everything. There was no WWE. There was nothing like that. Uh, there was the WWWF, owned by uh, Vince Sr., and his territory was New York and Boston and, uh, uh, I think, Toronto and Montreal and, uh, you know, throughout the East. And then there were other promoters that uh, were in the other parts of the country. Vern Danya, who comes from Minnesota. Uh, you know, he had Minneapolis and and uh, Milwaukee, and even at Denver and San Francisco. I mean, individual promoters had, had different different territories. And when I started, it was in a territory. And it, it's because my grandfather was a professional wrestler. So I grew up with all those guys back then. Oh, wow. And the, the promoter wanted somebody who was, you know, in the province of wrestling, was smart to the business, and was an actual broadcaster. Well, by that time, I'd already been on the air like four years. So I started doing wrestling when I was 18 years old. Jeez. That's, uh, wow. I, I, I yeah. kind of figured that's kind of what, what got you kind of into it, because uh, you, you you have an announcer's voice, and it just worked out so well. There's some people that uh, that even work for currently WWE that they just throw on the air for color commentary that should probably be on color commentary. Yeah, really. Really. Uh, you know, but it, it's so much different. It, it's 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 certainly not what it used to be. Uh-huh. You know, I'll give you an example. You know, the the top heel, the bad guy in the, in the territory where I started, was a guy named Iron Mike DiBiase. It was Ted DiBiase's dad. <laughs> wow! So wow! Back and- yeah, that. Uh, yeah, and, and didn't he have like a heart attack in the ring or something that killed him or something? Yeah. That, that, that's exactly right. That, that's an interesting piece of, of wrestling history you're aware of. Yeah, he died in the ring. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, that's probably one of the many, uh, I mean, we don't have to go into any of this, but it's like one of the many tragedies of wrestling. I did an interview with Lanny Poffel yesterday, and uh, uh, he, yeah. he was talking about how, uh, you know, his brother, Randy, did so much for the wrestling industry, even allowed uh, Jake the Snake to have, let his... Uh, Cobra or whatever, Venomous Cobra, or, or well, they took the Venom out or whatever, uh, bite him yeah. in, in the arm, and uh, but yet they wouldn't uh, condole like uh, when he died. Vince McMahon wouldn't like 
say call up the the Papa family or, or and say uh, his condolences. Yeah, weird. You know what? I, I I don't know what I can say to that. Uh, you know, my relationship with Vince has always been good. Uh, you know, I certainly admire what he's done, but uh, you know, he, he he conducts himself the way he conducts himself. Uh, you know, uh, why he chose to do that, I don't know. Why why he carries a grudge to the point where Bruno Sammartino is not in the WWE Hall of Fame is 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 absurd. I mean, then there should be no Hall of Fame. Yeah. That's like having a football Hall of Fame and not having Babe Ruth. I noticed they put Hulk Hogan in there right away. <laughs> well, rightfully so. Rightfully so. But, you know, uh, the truth is, yeah, go ahead. The truth is that, that most of the fans today, if they say we're inducting Bruno San Martino, and this is the sad part about wrestling to me, is most of the fans today wouldn't have a clue who that is. They wouldn't recognize Bruno San Martino if he walked into their house. And he was like one, he, of the, one of the longest reigning champions, he, right? He was huge. 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 You know, he and Larry Zabisco had, had one of the great, they shot one of the, the best angles ever. And that was, it was really kind of based in truth. And that is, you know, Bruno and Larry are both from Pittsburgh. And Bruno had trained Larry. And Larry was the protege. And and the angle had Larry turning on Bruno. And they had a big cage match at Shea Stadium in New York. It was the, the biggest, uh, biggest wrestling event to that date ever. This was before pay-per-view or anything like that. This was just, from local regional TV. And it was so big that the undercard, the, the, the semi-main event, was Hulk Hogan against Andre the Giant. Oh, jeez. That's how big Bruce was. Wow. He bigger than and Hulk Hogan. Hogan. <laughs> you know, Zabisco was huge. And uh, that's another guy who should be in the WWE Hall of Fame. Yeah. You know, first ballot. Yeah. I, 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 I don't get it. I mean, I get it. You know, because someone's feelings are hurt, or or because it's not good for business, but it's it's wrong. Again, it's you know, how can you have uh, how can you have a baseball hall of fame without having Ty Cobb? Uh, it's all politics, more or less, I'd say. Well, it is, of course, but it's not my politics, so <laughs> so I'm okay with it. I, I I just don't think it's right, but uh, I think most you know old time fans would probably agree with me that. I don't get a vote. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. So one one, one one last question for for the wrestling portion of the interview. Anyway, uh, yeah. I, I want to ask: Do you miss your days in WCW? Because that's where I got to know you a little bit. Watching Thunder, watching your road reports on Nitro, and do you uh, miss all that? The only thing I miss about it, yeah, I certainly don't miss the travel. You know, I was on the road four to four and a half days a week. And I would never move out of Los Angeles. You know, a lot of the guys lived in Atlanta that were in WWE or, or in Florida. So they, you know, their, their flights weren't too bad. Uh, the, the two people that would never move would be myself and Roddy Piper, who lived in Oregon. Uh-huh. So, you know, we were always traveling. So I certainly don't miss that. Um, you know, I, I, my ego is such and gratified in so many other ways that I don't miss being on TV. Uh, I miss the camaraderie. It was some of the best fun you could ever imagine. You know, that, that's what I miss. Okay. I miss, I miss, I had the best fun was in the locker room. You know, the announcers, we had our own dressing rooms. And the best fun would be Dusty Rhodes and Bobby Heenan and myself and Tony Schiavone and Mike Tomei and, and Gene Oakland just telling stories and, and of course interacting with the guys as well you know that that was always great fun just the best and and, and i truly do miss that but you know, i keep in contact with most of the guys yeah you know and, and, and you know that's pretty cool i mean i can just kind of imagine that kind of just picture like almost like a campfire type of thing you know just telling stories about the old old days and everything and or even the current days at the time so what are well, do you, Okay, go ahead. <laughs> I, I think the campfire analogy is a great analogy because that's really the way it was. And, you know, we worked together many, many, many hours. You know, you can imagine the production hours that go into producing a live TV show. And, over, you know, I did eight syndicated TV shows as well that, 
you know, you're working together all the time, but then when it was done, we were still together. We chose to be in each other's company. Wow. Well, that's pretty cool there, there Lee. I tell you, I, I never knew that, and I don't think most of the other, uh, because, you know, they would never show that, obviously, on TV, you know, because they can't, they, can't, they can't show everything, but... <laughs> So, so any uh, any current projects besides the uh, Toy of the Tiger that uh, that you're working on right now? Uh, you know, I, I am actually. I'm working on on, on uh, well, I do uh, uh, one thing. I'll tell you about in a minute. But the one project that's uh, got a lot of my attention is I'm involved in putting together a radio reunion for the greatest radio station I ever worked at. That's not the, it's not the best known radio station I've ever worked at, but it was certainly the most fun radio station I worked at. And that was KRIZ in Phoenix, which actually ceased to exist in 1978. Okay. But, uh, you know, it's still, it's still, uh, you know, when, when radio people they can get together and they talk about truly legendary radio stations, there are about five or six sets of call letters that pop up. And that's one of them. So I'm working on that. I'm going to do that in February. And uh, what I started doing a couple of years ago, and I just really love it, is I'm an adjunct professor at uh, California Lutheran University in Los Angeles, actually in, in Thousand Oaks, which is an L.A. suburb. And uh, one semester, in fact, this upcoming semester that starts you know, uh, later on this month, I do a voiceover class. And then the next semester I do a, a radio, radio industry class. So I teach one day a week. But it's, it's just great fun. And uh, I feel very, very blessed to be able to you know, whatever knowledge I've gathered over all these years, to be able to pass it along. And uh, the best part of it is, is getting my, seeing my students actually get employed. That's very cool, i got to tell you, especially in, in any trying economic time, to actually see, you know, some of your students get employed and, 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 and ascend in the industry. It's terrific. Is there a lot of demand in uh, Los Angeles for voiceover work? Oh, this, well, this is it. Okay. This... this Los Angeles and New York, but primarily Los Angeles. Uh, and oddly enough, a, a lot of the uh, a lot of the, the voiceover that I will actually record in Los Angeles is not necessarily heard nationally. A lot of it is regionally. In fact, I remember a couple of years ago I did the uh, the commercial uh, for the Minnesota Twins. Uh, you know, do do commercials that my my friends and family here in Los Angeles would never hear because they air in other parts of the country. So, yeah, this really is the epicenter of, uh, of voice acting. <laughs> and it's just, not, a, just, a, just yeah. for any other act. Oh, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and I suppose over there, too, you can truly be as talented as you want to be. I mean, because I've talked to a few people who have done voiceover work, and it's just amazing how they're able to just do that. Like, I don't know how well I would do, like, when I did commercials when I was on the radio station, I don't know how well, I don't think I did as good as I could have done because I was just a student then, but but now it's like, I don't know, maybe if I gave it a shot, I, I could probably do a commercial pretty well, but, but, but it takes people with an actual good voice, and I think you have, you definitely have one of those uh, excellent voices for it. Well, thanks. Yeah. But, you know, they're also looking, they're also looking for, for real characters. If you, if you listen to commercials now, they don't hire announcers it, unless it's like a real straight voice, uh, you know, like a disclaimer sort of thing. But the people who do commercials are actors, and uh, and they're voice actors. And a lot of the voice actors are uh, screen and, and, and TV actors as well. You know, uh -huh. that, that, uh, that really exploded once, you know, once uh, it became a very, very lucrative, you know, lucrative field. Uh, you know, people that want to get in, you know, radio guys that I know that they all want to be in voiceover. So, well, you, you just can't do that. And does it pay well? And, and I come back to that as, well, you know, I can make more in an hour than you can make in a year on the radio. <laughs> wow. So it, it is very lucrative. So you've been able to make this as a career for yourself and take care of your family and, and, and everybody around you. And that's, that's what's really cool about that. You didn't have to work at a grocery store or anything like that to make a living, you know. No, I, you know, I, I, I've never had that kind of a job. Um, well, maybe I, when I was a kid, I, I had you know a couple of interesting jobs, but no, I've never, I've never done anything like that. And uh, it doesn't make me special necessarily, 
But I can tell you this, that I can say something that I think most men, men and women can't say. And that is in my entire career, you know, some days have been better than others. I don't want to let you, you know, think that it's all been wonderful. You know, some days are better than others regardless of what you do. But I've never been bored a single day in my career. Not one day have I been bored. And, I mean, how lucky am I? You know, who else can say that? Yeah, that's for sure. I don't think the, don't think the guy at the grocery store that you mentioned can say that. And I dig the guy at the grocery store. You know, God bless him. <laughs> but I know there are probably some days he'd, he'd, he'd rather be doing just about anything else other than be at the grocery store. <clears throat> well, the reason why I mis- the reason why I mentioned that there, there Lee, because I was the guy at the grocery store. I actually have worked at a grocery store before, and you know what? Yeah. I tell you, it's it's an all right job, but it, you're not making you're not getting rich off of it. That's for sure. <laughs> well, there, 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 there's and, and I tell this to my students and, and to any young people that are listening. You've got to understand that there is such a difference between having a job and having a career. And if you can have a career, you're, you're, you're happy, you're content. You, know, you, you, you get to grow up to be the person. And uh, I'm real lucky. You know, they're, 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 I don't know how many other people, you know, how many more people can really say that. This is really what I always ever wanted to do. And, and here I am, you know, all these years later, still doing it. So... It's great. I haven't done a, a, a radio show in many years. Uh, you know, sometimes I miss doing that just because of what we were talking about. You know, the state of radio is sure. really a noise. Uh, I think the future, future of radio is actually the Internet. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but because uh, it allows you to be creative, you know. Like your show. You, it's your show. You get to do whatever you want. Exactly. If you were doing your show on a network, you'd be doing what somebody else wanted. Yeah, that's true. That's kind of why I do what I do. I mean, I, I just wish that I, I got paid for it. See, I, this is all just a volunteer thing that I'm just doing because I love doing it so much. And I don't know what you saw on my website or whatever or, or what interviews you listened to or whatever, but, you know, it just it's a passion for me. And this is what I this is what I truly love. It's just that I don't live in L.A. or some bigger area where, in fact, I live in a small town with a population of maybe 500 people, you know. And it's just, wow. I love, I just love doing this. This is all I've ever wanted to do. Very cool. Then, then, then how cool do you get to do it? <laughs> exactly. How and, cool do I get to talk and, to Lee and, Marshall? And, and, that, <laughs> and that you live in a time where technology allows you to do it. Yeah. You know, 20 years ago, you couldn't have done it. No. And 20 years from now, my gosh, who knows what? <laughs> uh, that, that will allow people to, uh, to have their own shows and be creative and wonderful and spontaneous and humorous. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's terrific. And, and it's, all, it's, it's all thanks to social <laughs> social media, too, has a big play on that, because I wouldn't have found you either if it wasn't for Facebook. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I, I'm not a Twitter guy. Uh, you know, if it were at a different point in my career, I probably would be, because I think it's a great promotional tool. But other than that, not interested. <laughs> you know, not, not interested in reality shows. Uh, yeah. Pretty much buys them, actually. Uh, you know, I, this, this might upset some people, but you know, I, I have no objection to people like the Kardashians uh-huh. or, Honey, or Honey Boo Boo or Paris Hilton or people like that. My objection is with the people that cause people like that to somehow be relevant. They're not relevant. Yeah. But I, I can't turn on TV anymore without hearing about Kim Kardashian's fetus. I mean, come on. <laughs> really? You really want that you know, to be the lead story of, of something? Who cares? Yeah, I agree. I, I definitely agree. This uh, There are some good reality shows out there, like uh, the educational ones. Like I'm a big fan of like the Dirty Jobs on Discovery Channel. <laughs> There's some that are wonderful. You know, one of my one of my secret pleasures is shows like Pawn Stars. Yep. Uh, you know, shows like that. But uh, you know, uh, believe me, Jersey Shore or any show like that. Come on. Do really? You, do you think they'll ever? Really? Do you think they'll ever do like a, a radio reality show at all? <laughs> the radio well, star. <laughs> I think we're doing one right now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but, but, you know, the cable opened up, you know, uh, there was such a need for 
programming. I understand it. I, I understand how shows like that came about. You know, you've got to come up with programming. And that's why if you look at all the shows that are available, oh my gosh, there are just some that are ridiculous. I'll tell you what show I like watching it because it really validates my, my, my opinion is I watched Joe McHale on The Soup. Okay. And just to see the moronic things that people will spend their time watching is, is I find very funny. Actually, I find it very sad. <laughs> but very funny at the same time. <laughs> yeah, because that, that show is actually pretty hilarious. It's, it's almost like a Tosh.0 kind of, more or less, kind of similar with the videos and stuff. Yeah, exactly. 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 Well, but, I, I tell you what there, Lee, I, I really appreciate you uh, taking the time out of your busy day to let me talk to you. First of all, this has been, you have no idea how much this means to me. I know I said that in the email, but this is really uh, very inspirational for me. To talk well, to good. You. you should be inspired, and you should be inspiring others. And the reason I decided to do the show, like you said, I went to the web sh website, and you do a reels, Joe. And, and I like that. And, and there's always going to be room for that sort of that sort of uh, that sort of show. So uh, have me on again. Oh, I definitely will. Uh, maybe next time we could do a, a video show, like a Skype thing, or like uh, if you have a, a webcam or something. <laughs> sure, sure. All right. Well, sure. well. Thank you very much, man. And I, I do appreciate that. And uh, uh, any and any words to your fans at all? Because I'm sure you still got some fans out there. Well, I've always appreciated the fans, you know, uh, uh, to this day, you know, uh, you know, there are people that stop me and, you know, don't know me as, as a voice actor and don't know me from radio, but know me from TV and, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful, I'm sincerely thankful, you know, especially, you know, some people will watch those old AWA shows on ESPN Classic or wherever they're showing, you know, shows that Eric Bischoff and I did 30 years ago or however long ago it was. <laughs> uh, it's kind of neat to be hanging around. You know, I feel a little bit like Lucy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hey, that's, <laughs> that's cool. Yeah. No, that's really cool. Well, I tell you what, thanks again, and uh, I hope you have a good rest of the day, and uh, I'll let you know when I put this interview up. I'll send sure, you a give, give my regards to my friends in Minnesota. Oh, I will. <laughs> All right, All man. Right. You have a good All one. Right, and that was the great, legendary Lee Marshall. And boy, that, well, I didn't think we'd be talking this long. It's already over 32 minutes long, but hey, that's okay. I hope you got it. Uh, uh, and wow, I can't believe that he actually, he actually, he actually likes my show. Wow, that's, uh, that's pretty cool. I, you know, I'm not going to go into the big story of, of, of things, but, uh, it's very cool to, to know that, uh, uh, that he appreciates what I do. Just like I, I've always appreciated what he does, uh, <clears throat> just a variety of different things that he's done in his career, whether it be wrestling announcing, uh, radio announcing, or vice versa, or TV announcing, or just anything, to video games. I mean, when you have a voice, you can definitely, if you if you are gifted with the the gift of voice, uh, and you use your voice well, it goes to show what you can make out of yourself. That's for sure. And and he's a he's a legend of the business, not just professional wrestling. But just anywhere when it comes to commercials, maybe you guys have heard some of the commercials that he's done uh, in the audio industry, or you know, on TV or on the radio or whatever. But it's a rare treat, and I, and the fact too that he does the voice for Tony the Tiger. He's currently right now, as we speak, the voice of Tony the Tiger. Uh, he does, you know, anytime you see a commercial, he that's him. Well, that's not him, but that's his voice is Tony the Tiger. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> Uh, I'm a little humble, I tell you. Wow. <laughs> well, I tell you what. Thanks for tuning in for, to another episode of the Frankie Sausage Show where you just don't know who you're going to run into. Hope you guys have a good Valentine's Day. And uh, that's my Valentine's Day treat to you guys. So hope you enjoyed it. Lee Marshall on the Frankie Sausage Show right here on YouTube.com.